Good evening, everybody. All of you know Ray Dalio as one of the most accomplished investors of our time, and his firm Bridgewater Associates as the largest and most successful hedge fund in the world. What you may not know about Ray is three decades of personal, business, and philanthropic experience in China. His knowledge, affection, and respect for the Chinese culture and people have led to a real understanding of China and many deep and intimate friendships. Ray's relationship with China has been a family affair that began 35 years ago when Ray was invited to teach economics and financial markets. He went out of curiosity and brought his family along. They were immediately struck by the people they met and who cared for them, their warmth and their kindness. They found a country underdeveloped economically, but a culture highly advanced. Over the years, Ray came back again and again, supporting China's leadership as they began building their financial system. In fact, he helped to establish their first stock exchange. Ray's family came back as well. They immersed themselves in Chinese culture and education. Ray's son attended local Chinese schools. The family formed a deep affection for the people, coupled with a natural desire to support them. When he was a teenager, Ray's son visited a local orphanage, and finding it filled with physically handicapped children, he learned that many could be healed for as little as $500. He took it upon himself to raise 70000 back home. Since then, the Dalio family has raised many millions to help special needs orphans in China. Today, Bridgewater manages investments and provides advice to the country's leading institutions and senior policymakers. The good work of Ray and his family's philanthropic activities are provided through the China Care Foundation, the Beijing Dalio Foundation, and the China Global Philanthropy Institute. Ray's personal journey with China and the many trusted relationships he has built with senior leadership have made a contribution towards improving the knowledge and understanding between the Chinese and American people, a contribution that aligns closely with the mission of the National Committee. As you all know, our country's relationship today with China is marked by deep strategic distrust and a lack of meaningful high-level communication. Both countries have constituents that view the other as a threat or even as an enemy and advocate, advocate for, this, for disengagement. These notions are growing in popularity and, in my judgment, are misguided and take us in the wrong direction. With the People's Republic of China recently recognizing its 70th anniversary, our two nations shared history in many important respects would suggest otherwise. Cooperation and engagement have benefited both our nations. The U.S. business community wants engagement, not decoupling. We seek cooperation and healthy competition while we each defend our respective national interests. We want negotiations that lead to substantive agreement and outcomes, not tariffs. We don't support a trade war as a strategy. We want to compete, but insist we do so on a level playing field. With that, I am delighted to present the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations 2019 Gala Honoree, Ray Dalio.
Would you mind? Th thank you so much, Evan. Um, I'm so incredibly in awe of the people who are in this room. You know, some have been mentioned, uh, Dr. Kissinger, Carla Hills, Steve Orleans, um, but there are many, 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 many more, so I'm very humbled to be here. And the way I think of, we, we each have perspectives, uh, but it's, it's a little bit like the parable of the blind man and the elephant. You know, um, we each touch a little bit of our, of China, and we all have opinions, uh, maybe too many opinions. Uh, and there's a lot of argument about what the right opinions are, and I can't say what the right opinions are. I can only share the perspective that I've acquired, and so whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but it's been my perspective. As Evan said, uh, when I well, I, I was lucky enough to go to China in, in, in 1984, so 35 years ago, as a guest of uh, CIDIC, which was uh, the only window company at the time. That was the only company that could look at the outside world and deal with the outside world. And I, you know, at that time, I would bring, um, as a gift, $10 calculators to people who ran companies, and they thought they were miraculous machines. And I remember sitting, uh, giving a, a lecture to teach them about the financial markets on the 10th floor of the chocolate building, and to look out on the chocolate building, and there were all the hutongs that were down there, and then to imagine what China would be like, because China was opening up, you know, and I could see that the this is not a developed country. This is not an underdeveloped country. I've been to many other developed countries, but it was a highly civilized, intelligent, and warm country that had the, the potential. So I could see that the world was here in cost, and, this, and China was here, and there was going to be an opening up, and the world would change as a result of that opening up. So I looked out on the hutongs, and when I looked at the hutongs and said, this is going to change, you know, they said, you don't know China. And I said, okay, I don't know, but uh, there's globalization, and who knows what would happen. And since then, China's uh, income levels have increased by 26 times. Its share of world GDP went from 2% to 22%. Um, its poverty rate went from over 88% to less than 1%. Its life expectancy increased by 10 years. There's no greater miracle than has happened in China. And I've been uh, in the fortunate position to know the Chinese people. And from all levels, as Evan described, I, I, through my son's eyes, and, and he taught me really about philanthropy, so through my son's eyes, um, I um, was in the orphanage system. And so I met people there. I, I met his teachers at school. Um, I met uh, people who were here, uh, uh, Securities Exchange Executive Council, Wang Bu Ming, uh, Wang Jun, um, Jesse, Jesse Wong, um, Wang uh, Li, um, Gao Xi Ching, many people who have become 30-year type of friendships. And then I was able to see things. And so I can only describe what it is through my eyes. It's, to me, um, the perspectives are different. And one of the leaders described to me that the essence of that difference is that in the United States, the United States is a country of individuals and individualism, and it treasures the individual. It treasures the revolutionary individual, the Steve Jobs type of personality who will disrupt the system and so on. And in China, um, it is the family, and as an extension of the family, the collective. And he described that the word country consists of two words, two, two characters, which is state, family, and that there's a top-down system, and there are different core values. There's much in, that's the same, but there is also a different perspective. 
And that perspective then gets reflected in some of the differences in the conflicts that we see, such as maybe the NFL conflict and so on. Um, the issue is the ability to see things through each other's eyes. I've been very lucky to be uh, dealing with particularly economic policymakers so that I could see things through their eyes. And of course, economics has also shifted to geopolitics. And by being able to see things through their eyes, I would say that by and large, um, I would be doing the same sort of economic policies that they've done, and that if I was to look for the, uh, the long term in terms of productivity and the like, and the things that are happening in the way of innovation, that entrepreneurship, creativity, capitalism in China, and these types of things, the reforms. But we're going through a particular period of time, too, where there was uh, a debt adjustment and how to manage that. Sometimes it seems that, a, that when you do healthy things in, in constraining the debt, that it is a lot less fun and a lot more painful than when you have a great time getting into debt. So there are these types of adjustments that are, that, that are being made. And um, so as I look at this, my responsibility is a, um, an economic investor, a global economic investor, is to try to find what are the elements that make countries succeed and fail, and to do that over time. And that's led me to develop indicators and literally quantify those indicators into leading economic indicators for the well-being. In my study of watching uh, why reserve currencies and the countries behind them have risen and declined, with the help of my fabulous research team, uh, we've been able to look through times. Those are arcs. Those are long arcs. In other words, um, let's, the, there's the U.S. as the existing r world's reserve currency. Before that, there was the British Empire. Before that, there was the Dutch Empire. And these things take place over long periods of time, 100, 200 years. Many of those we can't see, but yet they take us by surprise, like the change in the reserve currency. And the factors that we see over a period of time um, in terms of the indicators that we put together are, I'll describe it in, in, in brief. Indicators first of education and civility. The better the education and the more the civility of the behavior of people together. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is a good leading indicator. And then technology. The invention of new technologies. Technology is a, not only a commercial asset, it is a military asset. The capacity to build technology is a leading indicator. For example, you know, when the Dutch invented ships that can go all around the world and they carried guns, uh, because in Europe they fought a lot, then they were able to account for half of world trade, Holland, because of the importance of technology. Then you get improvements in output, GDP rises. And then you have larger and larger shares of world trade. It's a reflection of the competitiveness of how that arises over a period of time, because you grow because you're competitive and you raise those living standards. And as you go globally, it's the development of the military, because you need the military to both protect your trade routes and also to protect um, the, the natural resources. And then with that, there's always the development of a financial system, a financial hub. You know, in, in, in the Dutch Empire, it was Amsterdam. Then it was London. Then it was New York. And increasingly, it will be Shanghai. And this is an evolution. And with that, there's the development of a reserve currency, because it is the medium by which um, there is a common currency and a common exchange rate. And when that exists, it also means that those countries can get deeper into debt because everyone wants to save in the currency and you set, and you're lent that currency and then they get deeper in debt and the economies get overextended. And that is sort of the history of the rise and declines of empires and there's a certain destiny that happens as a result of that. And I want to share with you just a couple of slides. <clears throat> um, we, we, thanks to this wonderful research team over there, um, we, 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 this group digs through 
archives of statistics over, over um, long periods of time so that we can develop indicators of each of those things, of, of education, um, infrastructure, technology, output, and world trade. I wish I had the time to show you them all, but I, wanted, I, I, I want to convey to you that this first chart, which I can't see all that well from up here, but what it does is it shows um, these indicators applied to all the major empires starting around 1500. So you could see the rises and declines of each of those empires. This is the average of these indicators. And I think it, it helps to give me perspective, and I, and, I, and I hope it gives perspective, because you can see that red line is the red line of China. And what you see is not only rising at a strong pace, but you also see where China was in the relative importance throughout history. China was, for most of its history, the most important or one of the most important empires in the world. Far ahead of, the United, the, the, of Europe, there was no United States, far ahead of, of Europe in, in inventing the printing press 500 years ahead and so on. And it is because of an approach. It is not our, an American approach. It's not democracy, it's not, uh, but it is an approach. It's their approach, a, a Confucian approach. It has to do with the way that they're operating. And so there are things that make Americans American and there are things that make Chinese Chinese. And we can't ever expect that we're gonna make the Chinese like Americans and to adopt our system or to make or any more than they should expect that Americans should be made like Chinese. And so as we have that type of competition, I'll, I'll take you back just, we, we took it back to the Tang Dynasty in China. So if you show the next slide, or maybe I'll hit this. That's what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I blew it. Uh, okay, no. There we go, Tang Dynasty, uh, and so on. Wow. So there's a tremendous culture and a tremendous capability in history that has to do with what, what they exist. And so it is with great admiration, I have great admiration for the Chinese, a different system. And with that, um, there are wars. We use, I, I don't like the word war rather than negotiations, but there is, you know, there's a trade war, there's a technology war, there is a geopolitical war, and there could be capital wars. And that is the nature of the environment. And how that's approached is going to determine what our futures are like. And I honestly don't know how, we'll, how it will be approached. We want to be optimistic. But as uh, Graham Allison, who was here tonight, described in his Thucydides trap de description, there's a certain destiny to, the, to arguing about those things and not a global world legal system that gets us through those things. So when I look at it, I think that I, I hope that it is done with mutual understanding, that it is uh, that instead of wars, which mean lose-lose relationships, that we approach this with win-win relationships by seeing each other through each other's eyes and not expecting the others to be like us in all respects and which we evolve through time. So anyway, I'm done. Thank you very much for this great honor. I appreciate it very much. <laughs>